So I'm going to go ahead here and, and get started, I guess. Uh, the monitor says that uh, the, the uh, session is being recorded, so eventually the in-person people can uh, uh, watch the beginning of the presentation to start with. So uh, uh, anyway, thank you very much. Uh, my name is, is Brent Mai. I am the uh, director of the Volga German Institute and the Dean of Libraries at the University of North Florida in Jacksonville. So I'm coming to you today, however, from uh, Nashville, Tennessee, where I'm here uh, getting ready to go to the Broncos football game tomorrow. So uh, ready to cheer on the old home team. And we somehow managed to once again skirt the most uh, the biggest part of the devastation of the hurricane this last time around as well. So we're very happy about that and made it to Jacksonville. Um, so happy to be with you today to talk about uh, Russian resources for Volga German genealogy. Uh, there are a lot of resources as well that uh, you can use uh, here in the States. There are lots of resources in, in uh, Germany. Um, there are uh, lots of Volga German descendants also in Argentina, uh, in Brazil, also in Canada, and there are resources for those. Microphone, the space key. Did my speaking go away? David, I'm using you as my barometer if I'm still on here. Something popped up, popped up on the screen and said I wasn't being my, uh, I was muted again. Are we all right? Oh, but now I'm back again. Okay, well, I will keep going. Um, uh, today we're going to talk, though, about the, the resources that we can get from uh, Russia and, and parts of the former uh, Soviet Union. So hopefully that will be of interest to some people here. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do, though, is talk a little bit about the differentiation of uh, Germans from Russia. The Germans from Russia is a very, very broad category of uh, folks. And I'm talking only about resources that deal with the Volga Germans. So the Volga Germans are one of four major uh, categories of folks that are classified as Germans from Russia. Uh, the oldest group is the St. Petersburg Germans up at the top of the screen. Uh, they went to, when Peter the Great moved the capital of Russia from Moscow to St. Petersburg, he invited a lot of uh, German craftsmen and clerics and, and all sorts of uh, German people uh, to come to the capital to uh, build a Western style capital, to learn, uh, train the people how to run a government in Western style. And a lot of those folks were German. So there's a big contingent of folks and their descendants who are called St. Petersburg Germans. The second group uh, came under uh, the invitation of Catherine the Great in the 1760s, and they went to the Volga, which is over at three o'clock on the uh, map here. And that's the group we're going to talk about the most. So we'll deal with them a little bit later. Down at the bottom, the Black Sea Germans uh, were invited to Russia by Catherine the Great's grandson uh, to settle. And that settlement started just after 1800, uh, and thousands and thousands of Germans moved down there. Then the fourth wave of Germans into Russia uh, settled in what has, is the historical area of Volhynia, uh, today partially in Poland and partially in Ukraine uh, at the nine o'clock uh, hour there in our little circle of Germans. Uh, those folks started coming there uh, very shortly after the emancipation of the serfs uh, in 1861, and uh, that move continued all the way up until the fall of the Tsar in 1917, you had Germans moving into that area. So those are the four major er major groups of Germans in Russia, but we're going to deal with only the Volga Germans now. Now, as I mentioned over on the right-hand side of the screen, they came under the invitation of Catherine the Great uh, and her second uh, manifesto. And uh, in 1763. So they came at that particular point and moved to Russia. The, uh, they were coming for, for uh, several different reasons. Uh, this was getting toward the end of the Seven Years' War. They were looking for freedom to, uh, for religious practices. 
uh, was a big one. Uh, they were free of, of taxation for 30 years. Uh, they could worship as they chose. They were free of military conscription for them and their descendants forever. Uh, we'll discover here shortly that forever was 110 years roughly. Um, and they also got low interest loans uh, to go to Russia as well. So those were some of the, the factors that brought uh, Volga Germans to uh, Russia. So get back over here. All right. About 95% of the Volga Germans came from Hessen and the Platinet. That's the false region, Baden-Württemberg, uh, for example, in southwest uh, Germany. Uh, I love this little map here, these, these two maps, because they just show you that uh, the hodgepodge of various uh, areas in Germany uh, that were from which the Germans came uh, and went to Russia. And this makes it very, very difficult to go backwards into uh, Germany because Germany didn't exist at that time. It was all these little independent kingdoms and duchies and independent cities and, and uh, that were changing constantly. And you can notice uh, in both of these uh, maps here that the areas controlled by a particular family were not even contiguous. So uh, finding records going through Russia back to Germany uh, can be very difficult just in identifying exactly where you came from in Germany. So as we move now on to some other slides here, I wanted to let you know I'm going to be covering this, uh, the documentation that's available uh, backwards from the way that you would normally go about it as a genealogical researcher. If you started today and went back uh, Russian records from 1900 and then back to 1850 and then back to 1800 and back into the 1700s. That's how you would research going backwards. But to understand how the documents all fit together, it's a little easier to explain them going forward. So we're going to start with the records that uh, are available in Germany that talk about these people who are leaving Germany and going to Russia. So this screen now uh, talks about uh, a book that I put together with Donna Reeves Marquardt, uh, a, an amazing researcher. And uh, we looked at records in, in Germany, the, the former German areas, uh, that talked about people who were leaving for Russia. And on the, the, right, the left-hand side of your screen, you can see uh, a parish register entry from Frankish Krumbach, uh, in Hessen, which is talking about people from that uh, uh, parish that are leaving for Russia in 1766. And up above uh, is uh, uh, a record from the Kotzvig, uh, uh, Kotzvig sorry, uh, parish, which is in northern Germany. And this is talking about people who are one guy here uh, who is married in 1766, but he's identified as a Russian colonist getting married in this parish uh, of Kosvig on his way to Russia. So we gathered a whole uh, bunch of these kinds of documents together uh, in this book, The German Migration to the Russian Volga, and uh, then they are footnoted uh, where they ended up in uh, Russia, which one of the colonies that they ended up in. We'll get a little bit more into detail about colonies here in a second as well. However, we've got a little sideline trip that happens to a good number, uh, give or take 20% uh, or so of the Volga Germans actually went to Denmark first in the, 18, in the 1750s and early 1760s. Uh, there were uh, Frederick uh, of Denmark, the King of Denmark, not Frederick the Great of, of uh, Prussia, but Frederick of Denmark, invited Germans to move into new, newly uh, acquired areas in what today is part of Schleswig-Holstein in Germany, but at that time it was part of Denmark. And lots of these folks moved to Denmark. Uh, they became very disenfranchised with what was going on there. They, the land was terrible. Um, things were not going well for them at all. And so these many, many of these people joined the migration then to move to Russia. So there is a, a book put together by uh, Drs. Alexander Eichhorn and Dr. Jacob Eichhorn and his wife, Mary. And uh, Alexander is in uh, Germany and uh, Jacob and Mary were here in Michigan. And they put this book together that identified 
uh, several thousand of these uh, folks who went to Denmark first and then later uh, moved over to Russia. So their book um, identifies in it the records in Denmark that they were using to put the book together identify for many people where they came from in Germany. So this is one way where you can find out um, a German ancestral home uh, if you happen to be one of these folks that went to Denmark first. That's sort of one of the main things I'll talk about here at the beginning is helping to identify where your family came from in Germany through uh, records that are no longer in Germany. So this is the Danish record side of things. So this trip from southwestern Germany to the Volga uh, settlement area uh, took the better part of a year. Uh, so they started moving in 187. The, the invitation came out in, in 1763. The first group arrived in Russia in 1764. So that took uh, an entire year to get there. For the most part, while you can see on here these little arrows that go various ways, uh, the red outline that I've given tells you the, the, the route that most of the Volga Germans took. Uh, so there were uh, five colonies founded in 1764. 10 colonies in 1765, um, uh, 21 colonies in 1760, uh, sorry, 1765. <laughs> and then um, all the rest of them were in, seven, it, sorry, in 1766 and all the rest of them in 1767. Uh, so lots of folks made that move in the, started in 66 and ended up on the Volga in the summer and early fall of 1767. Uh, a long journey. So, uh, and we have some uh, parts of that journey that are also documented uh, in Russian records. So the first part of that involved going to the port of Lübeck and then sailing to Aranyabaum, which was the port at that time for the relatively new city of St. Petersburg. Um, and you would disembark uh, there in the uh, uh, harbor of St. Petersburg, and then be ferried across to the little village of Oranienbaum, and that's where um, uh, a man named, uh, um, oh my goodness, I just lost the name, uh, uh, <laughs> documented everybody getting off the ships there. And uh, anyway, you can see a piece of, of one of those, a page from one of those where it itemizes all the different people getting off the ship. Uh, the, the parents and then ages of each of the children and their names as well. It also tells from where they came. Sometimes this is a very specific ge geographic location. Oftentimes it may just say something like Hessen or from Darmstadt or um, Isenburg, which were, uh, and they're not talking about the town of Darmstadt or Isenburg, but the area of those uh, around those places. So uh, this is another great document for that. Uh, the book down in the, in the far lower right-hand corner was uh, published by Igor Pleve. Um, it uh, documents the uh, people getting off the ship. However, there's a newer book as well that's there in the middle. Um, it's written in German and Russian, but uh, it's easily, if you're looking for names, uh, it's easy to read it uh, as an English speaking, speaker. And uh, this one is actually much more accurate. Um, Andreas uh, It and uh, Georg Rauschenbach put these, this book together and it is excellent and, and corrects a lot of the mistakes that are in uh, Pleve's book in the lower right corner. Um, so that is a great resource uh, for you. Um, the next part of that journey, then they, they typically spent the winter then in the St. Petersburg area, and then the next spring they went over land to a, an area north uh, of Moscow where the Volga River becomes navigable, and they went from there then by ship, by barge really, but by ship down the Volga River all the way to Saratov. Um, we have a couple of uh, uh, publications that uh, itemize the colonists that were making this tour, this part of the trek as well. It does not include all of them, uh, but there are a good number of them uh, that are there. Several thousand of them are part of this record set. 
Um, I did the original publication uh, back in the 1990s. That's the green one on the right side, the transport of the Volga Germans from Oranienbaum to the colonies on the Volga. And then uh, the same guy who did the last book, one of those two, uh, Georg Rauschenbach, he has put together a new uh, version of that same list. Um, I'll be the first to admit his is much better. Um, it is it, The lists, however, are in German, so that made it easier to transcribe names and things like that. But uh, it, his book also then uh, does a lot of cross-referencing between the different uh, uh, document sets that we have. So it's a fantastic resource. Uh, and it uh, basically duplicates a lot of the information from the one on the right, but has uh, added indexes and things that make it very worthwhile. So there are two different publications where you can get the information uh, about the second part of the journey than arriving in uh, the Saratov area. Okay. There are a couple of terms that it's good to know uh, as well. Uh, the, this is the, a little map of the Volga German area. It's about 125 miles square, so not a terribly large area, about 15,000 uh, uh, square uh, miles. Um, for those of you who happen to be farmers, you know that it's about 10 million acres, about 4 million hectares. Uh, so it's a relatively small area. Uh, compared to some parts of the world. Uh, in, in total, 30,600 colonists uh, survived this journey. The previous slide also mentioned that about 17% of those in the second part of the journey uh, never made it. But there were 30,000 of them that eventually got there and they founded 106 mother colonies of which 101 uh, survived the first uh, five or six years. Uh, the first one that was uh, founded was Dobrinka, which just happens to also be the one that's the farthest south uh, of the Volga German colonies, uh, founded on the 29th of June in 1764. And then the last colony was Yagodnaya Polyana on the 16th of September in 1767. There was one little set of straggler families. Um, I know the exact number, but it's about 20 of them, uh, uh, settled the colony of Pabachnaya on the 4th of July in 1773. So that they came much later, uh, but also uh, settled there in the Volga region. So this is the area that we're dealing with when we're talking about the records for the Volga Germans. So get to where I can advance to the next screen. For those of you who have worked with Volga German records or with Russian records at all, um, it's an interesting, uh, set of uh, situations, complications, I'll call them, that we run into uh, with those. Over, we have multiple languages, Russian, German, and English now. Um, we have multiple alphabets uh, going from Latin and Cyrillic, and we have multiple names. Geographically, the names of the colonies uh, changed over time and had a variety of different spellings and, and uh, depending on uh, what kind of uh, use you're using them, they have different endings and things, which we don't really deal with here in, in English. Uh, but further complicating things, uh, the, uh, the Cyrillic alphabet at that particular time had 37 letters in it. Today, there are 33, the Bolsheviks removed four of them. Um, the Latin, in Latin, we have 26 letters. Um, there happen to be three diacritics, which are the German three letters with the umlauts over them, and then they have the S set as well uh, to work with. Um, the thing that's very interesting, I think, is that 12 of the letters look li alike. The Cyrillic and the Latin letters look alike, but only five of them actually are. Uh, so if you uh, look at Sherbukovka uh, uh, in, in Russian, uh, the R looks like a P. Uh, but it's an R and not a P, and you know, that sort of thing. The B in, in Cyrillic is a V. Um, then we're complicated uh, for German in particular by the fact that in Russian there is no H. There's no H sound and there's no H uh, in the alphabet. That is a very common letter in German. So Heinrich becomes Geinrich. Uh, most often, the H is substituted with a G, although depending on the German dialect, it can also be a K. So you can have Geinrich and Keinrich uh, going on. 
Um, in German, there's no CH sound like we have in English for church. They don't have a CH. So in German, you kind of have to, and Russian has CH as a common uh, sound. So in Russian, in German, you have to fake that sound. And that one you'll see in that middle column under Sherbakovka is called German Sherbakovka. So you have SHCH uh, going on, or going farther down that list, you'll see TSCH. That's how the Germans work around to getting to a CH sound. They say sh, and they put a t at the front of it. So then they end up with a ch, which gets them to a CH sound. Um, and then also, if you think about it, in the 1760s, most Russians didn't know how to read and write, and most Germans didn't know how to read and write. So you've got a, a barely literate German telling a barely literate Russian what to write down, and they're writing it in, in Cyrillic often. So it's an interesting uh, conundrum for uh, dealing with all these various things. The other thing I mentioned was the multiple names of these colonies. So these are just three I kind of chose at random. Schaefer, for example, on the far left, also went by Lipovka. Well, that's how you would say it in English and in Russian as well. But in German, you're going to have the W instead of the V. Uh, in English, we don't deal with umlauts. So we have this, the third and the fourth ones are the exact same word, just spelled differently according to us. Um, and then you have it in Cyrillic, Lipovka and Schaefer. Um, Sherbakovka just sends everybody over the edge because of the variety of names there. Another situation that we have is dealing with the fact that in 1924, uh, the autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic of the Volga Germans was set up. And at that point, the colonies that, did, that previously had not had German names were given German names. So it, all of a sudden, uh, Sherbakovka became Mühlberg. So, and uh, uh, war, uh, across from, from that, we've got uh, Warrenberg, which originally, the original name of Warrenberg was Gauter. So you've got multiple names for, for these things. So these are all things that play into our, the difficulty with working with Russian records, uh, especially when dealing with the Volga German colonies and other German colonies, I'm sure. So the most helpful set of documents that we have uh, dealing with the Volga Germans uh, are the census records. Now in, in Russian, they're not called censuses, they're called Reviskaya Skaska, which is uh, technically uh, a revision list. The first census in, in modern day Russia was conducted starting in 1702. It took about 10 years, but they started in 1702 by Peter the Great, whom we'd mentioned earlier. The next census, which was around 1719, was actually a revision of the first sentence, so census. So then it's, it's called a revision list. And each one after that is therefore a revision of the previous one. Uh, so, so it's not like the censuses that we have in the United States and Canada, for example, which are, get, are, are at, taken to indicate a population and a location of someone on a given day at a given time. And that's the end. That doesn't tell you at all where they were the day before or where they were the day after. It's a one point in time census. The revision lists in Russia are not that way. They are accounting for all of the men on the previous census. So uh, they all do that sort of thing. There are 10 of them that apply to the Volga German uh, or the, that were taken before the all new Russian census in 1897, but only uh, the last eight of them deal with the Volga Germans. There was one taken in 1767, which happens to be the last year that the settlers were, were there. Um, and many uh, researchers refer to that census as the first settlers list. There is an extra one, which we're gonna talk about just a little bit later, um, that was taken in 1775 that only deals with the Volga German territory, some of the colonies. And then the rest of them you see there following 1877 or 1788, 1798, 1811, 1816, 1834, 50, and 57. So those are the censuses that we have. They're much more valuable than some of the American censuses because they actually track families, the men anyway, from one census to the other. So you, once you've found your family on the third revision, uh, you can generally track them uh, all the way to the 10th revision. 
Um, and then there's a 40 year gap to the next one. So that creates some other issues, but we have some helpful documents that can help you bridge that gap. Um, since I'm not hearing anyone, I hope somebody might type in a message if my sound goes away or something, by the way. So here are a list of uh, the Russian censuses that include the Volga German colonies. Uh, we have all of them available for 1767, except for 16 of the colonies. Uh, they have not been located. That doesn't mean that they don't exist, that they have not been located. Uh, for 1775, there are a few of them. This was a special census, a special enumeration of people that was taken immediately following uh, uh, the uh, debacle of uh, Emilio Pugachev, who came through the area pretending to be the missing Peter III uh, and created havoc uh, among the colonies there. Uh, he spent several days uh, uh, roaming and pillaging through that area and uh, that census was taken in an effort to help identify whether any of the colonists had participated in the insurrection. So uh, that is a unique one, and there are only about a dozen colonies for which the 1775 census exists. Uh, but luckily for, for a chunk of them, there are several of the missing 16 colonies that were taken in 1775. In 1788, I have never seen one of these. We do know that the census was taken because we have population totals for men, women, and the total population in each colony, but I've never seen an actual census of, from 1788. In 1798, uh, there were 101 colonies extant at the time, and uh, we have all of those uh, censuses available. They have been published. You can see the, the green volume on the left uh, is the 1767 census. Uh, then the middle one, the gray one, uh, which I compiled, uh, uh, was done in 1798. And that includes all uh, 101 colonies, including maiden names for all of the women. So that is very, very helpful and a very valuable resource. It also is a census that includes three parts, the economy, population, po excuse me, population and agriculture. Um, it's a two volume set um, and you can get that from the American Historical Society of Germans from Russia in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, as well as some of the volumes of uh, the green ones on the left as well. Um, in 1811, Another census was taken. It only included men, so there are no women on that one, and we have located 34 uh, colonies records for that census. Uh, 1816 was another only men one for some recordings. There are some that have women. It's confusing when we don't have all of them to compare them, but uh, there are only a few of those that I've ever seen, at least in, in my research. In 1834, there were 102 colonies that existed at that time, and a new one had been founded, and uh, we have all 102 of those colonies available as well. Um, and then in, in 1850, there are many colonies that are, are available. I think about 40 of them have been translated so far. And in 1857, there are 70 uh, colonies that have been translated so far. There are more that exist. We're still working on those. And then we jump to 1897, and there we have a little bit of, of uh, uh, a clerical issue with those. Uh, the, as you might imagine, these censuses were uh, taken by hand, and then uh, a copy was made by hand, and that copy was sent to uh, the to uh, St. Petersburg, the capital at this time, uh, for the records there. Uh, the copies of the seven, of the 1897 census uh, in St. Petersburg were were destroyed by a fire uh, that took place early during the Soviet years, although that. Didn't, it didn't have anything to do with them intentionally doing it. There was just a fire. Uh, but si since that time, originally we thought there were none of them that remained. But since that time, we have found some of them, some of these sort of so-called uh, carbon copy type things that do exist in the archives in Russia and we have found uh, that are not in St. Petersburg. And we have about a dozen of those so far that have been located. Uh, there. So this is a, an exciting set of documents. And if you happen to be someone who has uh, a, a col colony that can be tracked through all of them, you get a very good uh, record for your family that can bridge the gap from the United States all the way back through Russia to Germany.
Here are just some samples of some of these uh, documents. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner is the 1767 census. Uh, in the, the center there is 1811. They look different. Uh, down on the lower right is 1857, although this was one that was uh, taken. Uh, they didn't get done with these in one year. So this is, is one that was delayed. And this, this one's actually dated 1858, taken in April there. Um, and then some of them from, uh, one of them from the 1897 census, you can see, which is very different. Also, just so you know, the 1897 census is not a revision. It is an all new census of the Russians. And uh, so it does not connect back to 1857. So then we have uh, some other documents that might help with that. Uh, parish registers. So the parish registers, uh, each of these colonies uh, had a church in it. Uh, this is a picture of the, the uh, reformed congregational church in uh, the colony of Norca. Uh, but parish registers have basically five different types of data that you can get at that will, are helpful for genealogical research. Uh, we call them the registrations of uh, clerical acts. So the, the pastors would be involved in the baptisms, in a confirmation, in communion, and in marriage and burial records. So you can, through the baptism and through the burial records, get uh, dates for birth and death many times. Um, but also, it's interesting, too, that some of these other documents have survived. Uh, as well, like confirmation and communion re re records, and we'll talk just a little bit about those as well. So this is one of the communion registers from the colony of Norca. Um, uh, you think of it uh, that a communion register wouldn't have very much, but back in those days, they listed there on the, the left-hand page all of the people in the household. Um, and as children are born, they are added to this. Their birth dates are there. The marriage date is there. The date that they arrived in the colony if they had moved from somewhere else. If it was a daughter and she then married outside of the, the household, it, they cross-reference to the household in which she married into. Um, and then on the right-hand page, the first column there you have is the year of the confirmation, where they were confirmed, and then follows the columns of their uh, taking communion in that parish. Uh, here in Norca, it was the custom to take, com to take communion twice a year, so you'll see two dates for a lot of the people that are there. And then the far right-hand column of this register uh, gives you a death date if they happen to have died during that, in this case, 15-year period. Uh, the death date will be indicated there. So this is one record that basically includes everything, and I've, I've outlined it over here on the right-hand side uh, so you can see uh, what's available there, uh, the cut type of information. Uh, line by line, person by person. So very detailed uh, information. Uh, so if you have a chance to go after parish records in, in uh, for the Volga German colonies and they, they have communion registers, go for those first because they have the most data. So another set of records that we have that gives you information is uh, uh, the movement, uh, the immigration from Russia to the United States, Canada, Brazil and Argentina primarily. Um, as I mentioned, one of, the er one of the original enticements to move to Russia was for the uh, freedom from military conscription. Uh, this lasted then from uh, 1764 to 1874. And in the early 1870s, the Russians passed a Universal Conscription Act that took effect in 1874. And at that point, uh, immigration began to, to North America in huge numbers. Uh, the first groups uh, settling in, as you can see here on the map, settling in Ohio, Iowa, uh, Kansas, and Nebraska uh, in 1875. Uh, Nebraska was 1874. That got dropped off of this map. My apologies. Um, and then uh, by the time you get to 1887 and the folks that are settling in Fresno, you've got Volga Germans all the way from uh, north of uh, New York, uh, New York City in Orange County, New York, all the way to uh, Fresno County, California. So in roughly 15 years, a little less than 15 years, you've got Volga Germans from coast to coast in North America. They're also settling, you can see on the little map on the right-hand side, uh, down in Brazil, in Southern Brazil, 
as well as in uh, Argentina in three different locations there. All right, and then back to Russia though. So we have records in Russia uh, where in this particular case, this is one where you've got uh, Johann Peter Mohr is from the colony of Baidek, uh, is applying for a passport uh, in 1903. And this gives a lot of information about him and his family. Um, and they're, le they're making an application to go to, uh, to leave the country. And you'll notice here that in this particular uh, one, you've got uh, the uh, 33 out of the 42 uh, people on the village council have signed this, uh, um, basically testifying that he doesn't have uh, debts that he's leaving behind. Uh, so he's moving uh, to away from Russia, leaving the colony without any debt. Uh, so that's a good thing. Um, here's another one. This is a Russian passport translation for that. Um, so these have uh, a lot of detail on them, and they have copies of these in Russian archives as well. They are not available for all colonies, or at least we've not found them yet. Uh, we'll get to why that is here in just a second. I don't want to run out of time here. Ah, this is the, the reason here. So in uh, 1941, in June, uh, Hitler invades Russia, and Stalin uh, uses that uh, invasion as a pretense for rounding up all the Volga Germans and shipping them to camps in Siberia and Kazakhstan. So beginning on the 28th of August in 1941, uh, just a, a little under half a million Volga Germans who were still living there, everyone who was ethnically German in the Volga region, uh, got deported. Uh, and then by the end of September, so less than, than four weeks later, uh, about 500,000 uh, folks had been moved in 188 train convoys to uh, Siberia and Kazakhstan. Uh, the whole area was depopulated. This is why we have trouble with the records from that area now. At that same time, uh, Russian clerical folks came through the colonies and gathered up all of the documents from the colonies uh, and shipped those over the Urals as well for safekeeping. Now, uh, Hitler never made it to the Volga German area. He got stuck in, in Stalingrad, as we know from, from our history lessons. Um, but however, these documents got saved. They were sent over, over the Urals for safekeeping during the war. They came back following the war to this area, but there were no colonies there anymore. So they were uh, ended up being widely distributed among an, a, hand, a, a number of uh, uh, archives there in rather random fashion. Now, when you talk to Russian archivists, they swear that it's all very logical about where these documents are in which of five major archives. However, that is not true at all. There is just total random randomness for why some things are in one archive and some things are in another. For example, you know, five years of baptismal records for one colony are here, but the death records for that same set of years are in another archive and that sort of thing. So it's just uh, kind of exciting of, to figure that all out. So that's why we keep finding things in different archives. This uh, is just a, uh, a list of one of the cards that was used during the deportation. So these are folks that were still living. Uh, this is the Kisselman family uh, from the colony of Balzer. Uh, and it lists on the front of the card uh, as well down in the lower right, lower left-hand corner of the left-hand card, uh, which is the front. Um, it tells you that it was on the 15th of September that this uh, family was uh, loaded onto uh, the, uh, the train cars and uh, that they were in train number, train car number 779, and they were released then um, in Siberia and the colony that's listed there um, in Novosibirsk. So that is where this family ended up. Um, there was also, as you might imagine, a pretty uh, large number of these folks who didn't survive that trip as well. So uh, very interesting that this stuff still exists. Most of these records are in now what has been reclassified as a military archive in Volgograd. 
Okay. Some of them, however, we did manage to get published uh, in 2015 in two different volumes. These are groups that are coming from uh, the Stalingrad region. So uh, you can see there in yellow, that's the English translation of the title of this thing. Um, these two volumes are very difficult to come by. Their uh, ISBNs are given there, but uh, and if you're interested, I can get them to you later as well. But they are amazingly uh, packed full of information about which families went where. However, in non-German fashion, there's no index to this thing, which is these two volumes, which is very sad. <laughs> All right, moving on very quickly here. Uh, in 19... Uh, 56, the folks in the camps in Siberia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and places they had been put in by that time were uh, released from those camps. Uh, some of them did move back to the Volga region. So you will find that there are some uh, cemeteries that have Volga Germans in them. They were not allowed to go back to the colonies from which they came, though. So you will see here. Uh, for example, in the top left-hand corner, the Volga German Cemetery in Warrenburg, that's the original one, uh, and there's nothing that remains there. Uh, but then these new post-1941, uh, post-1946 cemeteries have some Volga Germans in them. This is some pictures of some of the uh, tombstones of Volga Germans that I took in 2015. So where are these records? I mentioned that they were in five different archives. They're in Saratov, Engels, Volgograd, Samara, and uh, the Archives of Ancient Acts in St. Petersburg. Um, the uh, LDS Church has been able to microfilm film only those that are in the Samara archives. So you can find uh, copies of those through uh, connections in Salt Lake City. Uh, there are surname charts that were uh, completed by uh, Dr. Igor Pleve and his uh, a group of researchers uh, beginning in the in the 1990s and they were uh, are made available some, some of them you can find uh, at the American Historical Society of Germans from Russia in Lincoln Nebraska um, and obtain copies of them there there are some of them in Salt Lake as well okay uh, this is what one of them looks like um, this is just a little synopsis of why the Volga Germans are interesting I think because they have a pretty unique culture uh, that includes all of these different pieces that lasted for 177 years. And those of us who happen to be Volga German descendants have taken with, descendants have taken with.